My name is Benjamin Penny. I'm one of the members of the committee that run this uh, China Seminar Series, the ANU China Seminar Series. Uh, so welcome. And um, this is the first time we've been able to do this with real people again. So that's uh, welcome. However, that explains why you're sitting in this rather unusual format. Uh, we have to keep everybody apart and everybody has to be masked, so thank you very much for that. Um, the one exception to being masked is the speaker, but what it does mean is that you have to stay one and a half metres away from Craig. I know Craig's very attractive, and we want to get closer than one and a half metres if we possibly could, but he has to put his mask on again if you want to get closer than one and a half metres. Um, so it's uh, a great pleasure to welcome Craig back to CIW, back to this building, back to ANU. Um, Craig was a postdoctoral fellow here from 2016 16. to 2018 18. before he took up a position at Melbourne University. So he must have done something terrible in a past life. Um, his position now is Senior Lecturer in Translation Studies in the Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. Just to quickly give you a run-through of his eminence, Craig holds two master's degrees, uh, one in Chinese literature from the University of Alberta in Canada, from where he comes, and an MA in Taiwan literature from National Zhongzheng University in Taiwan in Jai, exactly, an important place in Craig's biography. He then completed a PhD in history at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver in 2014. He's been a postdoctoral fellow at the American Council of Learned Societies. He's had a visiting fellowship at the Kyoto University Jimbun Kagaku Kenkyujo, or the Research Institute in the Humanities, a wonderful institution. And then, as I say, he came here as a postdoc um, and then went to Melbourne. We are, in a way, today celebrating the publication of Craig's first but wonderful and wonderful uh, monograph, Chinese Asianism, 1894 to 1945, published by Harvard in 2021. Um, that's not the only thing that he's been doing in 2021. Another book came out called Translating the Occupation, the Japanese Invasion of China, 1931 to 45, with University of British Columbia Press, which he co-edited with Jonathan Henshaw and Norman Smith, your cousin, is that? That's right. Yeah. Related. Uh huh. Um, he's got currently two research projects on the go, apart from presumably more of this kind of historical stuff. One is about Chinese perspectives on the China-Australia relationship from 1850 to 1972, and one on remote collaborative translation, which is something that I think more of us have done in the last few years uh, than we ever thought we would do. So it's, as I say, a very great pleasure to allow Craig to take the floor. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thanks very much for that wonderful introduction, Ben, and uh, thanks very much to, to Nancy and everybody at the CIW for having me back. I feel like this is kind of home ground in a way, so it's really exciting to... To be here. Um, I actually finished this book while I was a postdoc here. I worked on the project for about 10 years, off and on, of course, as, as you do. And um, just to give you an idea of, of, uh, of why I did this project um, and kind of how, how, how that informed um, the approach. As, as Ben said, before I did my PhD, I was a master's student at Zhongzheng University in, in Taiwan. And it was this great research institute for literature full of uh, young academics and graduate students, most of whom were looking at the, the Japanese colonial period and literature from that period. And so in Taiwan and elsewhere, I guess, but really, especially in Taiwan, issues of identity were really important. And a lot of my classmates were writing about 
um, how Taiwan kind of became Japanese or had Japanese identities um, in the late in the 1930s. So these ideas of overlapping identities of Taiwan, East Asia, Japan. That's kind of how I got started, and I I I had to do um, a research presentation related to these topics, and so I I did it on this guy Jiang Wojun. He ends up not being in the book at all, um, which you know happens. I'm kind of now I'm thinking I've got to go back and, and finish my work on him, but um, he was a Taiwanese writer living in Beijing. He lived there for decades, and during the war he wrote some articles that were very Asianist, very pro-Japan, but also about creating this East Asian identity. And of course, when you look at these texts from an area under occupation, or any authoritarian regime, actually. I mean, you could even apply it in, in, in some respects to, to texts in China today. Um, the figuring out the connection between what people are writing and what they're thinking is, is not really possible, right? So looking at that and trying to figure out was there something called Chinese Asianism, what I had to do was create um, a kind of continuity or look for, really looking for a long run of texts in the decades leading up to it. So that's how I ended up going all the way back to 1894. Um, so I guess I was trying to find out, was there something called Chinese Asianism? Or was this, as many people said, just a part of Japanese imperialism, an, an ideology of Japanese imperialism that was pushed on everybody else. And of course I found that you know, there were many, many decades of, of texts um, and it's much more complicated than that. So I ended up basically writing a conceptual history, which means that I was looking at Asianism I mean, I would never say it's an identity. There was no Asianist identity. It wasn't really an ism. I look at it as a concept that was used by different people in different times and different places. So, as you can see, these are my chapters. It's very temporally organized, but each chapter also has a kind of Asianism, a kind of theme. I've got the slogans. Each chapter had a slogan that was popular at that time. I'm not going to be all discussing all the chapters today. Of course, there's way too much going on here. Most of my talk today is going to be related to chapters 7 and chapters 8. And I'm going to be focusing on the connection with nationalism and specifically the idea of uh, Chinese leadership in Asia. Um, all right. So also... Usually, when you're writing history, you have to figure out, you know, how is it connected to today? Is it still relevant today? And the word Asianism has come up a lot in the... Oh, please can go over that. I kind of said that. I always forget to hit the clicker. All right. Um, so even though these concepts have kind of... You know, after the war in 1945, the idea of creating a united Asia really became a problematic idea because of its link to Japanese imperialism. So the term Asianism pretty much disappeared after 1945 from both Japanese and Chinese writings. Um, but you see it a lot in critiques of China. So in 2013, when I was getting close to finishing my, my dissertation, um, Xi Jinping hosted the Boao Forum for Asia. And you probably have heard of the forum, but in the 2013 forum, the main theme was this Mingyun共同体, a community of common destiny or a destined community. And a lot of China watchers and uh, Chinese media outside of mainland China were quite, quite critical of the discourse, of the terms used, because they said this... this um, there are too many similarities with Japanese imperialist writing from the 1930s and 1940s. But I think the, the connection there was a little bit tenuous. But looking um, 
So this is like the common critique of using Asianism. Looking at some other important people in the party, we have Wang Yi, who is now the foreign minister of the PRC. So he uses these ideas of Asianism in, in, and Chinese-led regionalism in a much more direct manner. Oh, when I was writing the, 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 first, the first part of the book, when I was, the first five years that I was writing, Wang Yi was not yet the foreign minister. He only became the foreign minister in 2013, I think. Um, back then, he was still the, um, the ambassador to Japan. And even then, I was looking at his writing because the China-Japan relation is kind of at the heart of these ideas of creating Asian communities. So in 2006, a really bad time for China-Japan relations. You probably remember the Yasukuni shrine visits, the Jiao Yu Tai, Jiao Yu Dao, the islands, um, the anti-Japanese demonstrations in China, the textbook controversy. It was really a nasty time. Um, there were many bad times, of course, in that relationship. But Wang Yi, he gave this an interesting speech and then a few months later published an article on a new Asianism. So Wang Yi says that he was formulating a theory of Asianism as a plan to strengthen China-Japan ties and to provide a terminology for the peaceful future of East Asia based on cultural commonalities. And to write this article, he drew upon late 19th century and early 20th century Chinese and Japanese texts about Asianism. He especially concentrated on Sun Yat-sen, the, the, uh, the, national, um, father, the national father of, of, of modern China, and Li Dajiao, one of the first um, Communist Party members. And I'll get to their, their ideas in a minute. Wang Yi basically said that his Asianism is based on their ideas, but it's still a 21st century approach for Asia's future. So now these kind of connections with Asianism have been made implicit and explicit. You, you can often see people writing about Asianism in relation to the Belt and Road, but this is the only real explicit use of Asianism that I see in the contemporary Chinese Communist Party. So today, uh, I'm going to take us back to the 1920s and the 1930s. And the decades leading up to that were really important for establishing uh, important concepts that were crucial to this idea of a united Asia, ideas of race uh, and race war, civilization, the idea of nation itself. But it's in the 1920s that you have lots of people writing. So we suddenly have this explosion of um, texts related to Asianism in China and organizations. And that's, um, uh, that's also the first time, maybe not the first time, but the, the strongest example of Asianism as uh, a, an idea for Chinese leadership in the future, for Chinese leadership of regionalism. So, sorry, I've got to point it. There we go. Okay, so I imagine most people are familiar with Sun Yat Sen to some extent. Um, if you went in, to school in Taiwan like I did, we used to have to bow to Sun Yat Sen, um, which. Uh, really indicates his importance. It's almost uh, nationalism to a quasi-religious kind of level. So he's considered the father, father of modern China in both Taiwan and mainland China, but more so in Taiwan. He was, of course, the first president after the 1911 revolution, but not for very long. Still, he was probably the most influential person in politics and maybe in intellectual circles in China until 1925 when he died at quite a young age. He started making speeches using the word Asianism as early as 1913. But 
those speeches weren't very famous. It's his 1924 speech that really changed things. 1924, Sun Yat-sen's at the, the height of his game. So in 1924, he, he had all these speeches on the three principles of the people. And the three principles of the people is the guiding ideology of the Republic of China. So really um, important in that he kind of clarified them at this time. They had been around before, but the fundamental writings are from 1924. And when I say clarify, I mean clarified a little bit because they're still not very clear. Now, he had six speeches on nationalism, one of the three principles. And his sixth speech, probably the most important, he explained that it was traditional Chinese or Confucian policies of governance that allowed smaller countries like Annam, Burma, Korea, and Siam to maintain their independence before the Europeans arrived. So this was important. Sun Yat-sen's understanding of the benevolence of the tribute system really shaped his idea on what China could be in the future and Chinese-led regionalization. Now, this influenced millions of people. In the speech, in the speech, he said, the present tide of events seems to indicate that not only China and Japan but all the peoples in East Asia will unite together to restore the former status of Asia. So the future is also the past as well. That's an important part of his Asianism. This is, so this is the 1924 Asianism speech. He said, if we want to realize Pan-Asianism in this new world, what should be its foundation if not our ancient civilization and culture? Benevolence and virtue must be the foundations of Pan-Asianism. Okay. So, um, this, sorry, I'm getting a little, little bit confused here. Um, I, I, I skipped the, the nationalism speech. There's an important part of the nationalism speech I have to jump back to. So in the nationalism speech, also in 1924, Sun Yat-sen argued that our, in order for China to realize our nation's true spirit, the Chinese nation must support the Ruoxiao nations, the small and weak, and oppose the world power. So this is also important, how he divided the world. And this Ruoxiao, I threw that out in Chinese because I'm going to come back to it in a minute. It becomes a key word in the 1920s. So then he's passing through Japan when he makes this speech. So the 1924 Asianism speech was on his way north. And what he was trying to do is convince the people in Beijing to work together and unify China. So China was still not entirely unified, but, but it was getting very close. And um, he was on his way to do it. So in this speech, he also, in this speech, Asianism speech, he sees the world as a, as a real dichotomy of West and East. So the West is defined by its materialism. And its materialism, in terms of how that works politically, is, in terms, is a hegemonic government. So, of course, this is a time when the West was invading all over the world. So it's what he called the ba dao, the, the way of the hegemon. And the East is the opposite of that. So the East, he defined by its spiritualism. And in terms of political representation, that's Wang Dao, the, the way of the king or hegemonic, or sorry, uh, benevolent governance. So the important thing is Asianism is based on ideas of benevolence, which of course China basically has a cultural monopoly on uh, thousands of years of writing about benevolence. So November 1924, after he makes this speech, it's reprinted all across Asia and even beyond, all across the world, actually. It was, it was amazing how far out it got very quickly. In Asia, in Taiwan, people really liked it because uh, they started writing responses to it and saying, well, you know, in, in the future, if we have a greater Asianism, which might mean something like... Um, I guess, the United Nations of Asia. There were all sorts of different words they used. Taiwan might end up having some more autonomy 
and pull away from the Japanese Empire. The Koreans weren't as happy because uh, after the speech, some Korean journalists went up to talk to Sun Yat-sen, and they said, well, what about Korea? You haven't mentioned Korea once in these few days you've been in Japan. And he said, Korea's an important topic, but I'm not going to talk about it right now. And he really offended them. So um, before this, Korea had really liked Sun Yat-sen, but he deliberately didn't talk about Korea because he was trying to work with the Japanese. Indonesians were very interested in the speech. A very young Sukarno wrote a long response and published it. Uh, I think it was called something like Indonesianism and Great Asianism. I can't remember right now. And um, he calls Sun Yat-sen his mentor. So it actually um, had a lot lasting influence upon his, his own intellectual journey. Now, back in China, the speech, it was actually published about a month or two later in China. So it was published right around the, 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 uh, the New Year or the, the Western New Year. And it was published and then republished and republished. It was very popular, and it convinced some intellectuals to set up these organizations for creating inter-Asian support. So they had lots of different goals, but they decided to work with other Asian communities in China. And China was quite um, cosmopolitan, I suppose, at that time, right? So um, in big cities like Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, the Chinese intellectuals started working with Vietnamese Indians. There were, you know, we don't really think about it, but there were thousands of Indians, many of them working at universities in China at this time. Uh, Koreans, uh, Koreans were very active in these organizations, and some of them ja Japanese too. Uh, very few, but there were some Japanese who joined these, these organizations. And a lot of it was related to this speech. So they started putting out publications, and you know I've gone through many of these publications, and they, in 1925, 1926, they just keep reprinting this speech and citing this speech. It becomes very canonical for these groups. Um, and this is partly because he gets to Beijing and basically doesn't get about his work of reuniting China. He does a little bit. But he's really sick. He ends up dying right after this. <laughs> So this speech was at, ended up being his final speech. But I'm not arguing that this movement in the 20s was caused by this speech. It was greatly accelerated, but it was part of a global zeitgeist, global movement towards greater regionalization. Even looking over in Europe, it's um, the first publication of Pan-Europa, which is seen as the defining text for the future European Union, also around the, it was in um, 1920, I think. Um, and even in China, the, there were, a lot of other people had written about Asianism in the time coming up to this. So um, Li Dajiao, uh, probably most famously, he wrote a few articles about Asianism in the late 1910s, so around the, the May 4th movement, um, before the Communist Party, before he starts up with the Communist Party. But he really disagreed with Sun Yat-sen's kind of essentialization of West versus East. He wanted uh, a, you know, a global communist community, and he saw Asianism as a step towards working with that. But basically, Li Dajiao doesn't say this. He was ripping off Trotsky's ideas because Trotsky was writing the same thing for Europe. Trotsky had written about the United States of Europe, saying European countries need to get together and create something, which he unfortunately called the United States of Europe. Um, but basically, Li Dajiao took these ideas and republished them as um, uh, ideas of, uh, for the future of Asia. He also heavily criticized Japanese Asianism. So a lot of people were, were writing about this. So there was, um, what I'm trying to say is there was a common discourse going on already. It was just accelerated by Sun Yat-sen. And of course, there were already big movements towards uh, internationalization around the world. Most importantly, the League of Nations. Right, League of Nations, 1919, and the Third International. So, first, the League of Nations. 
The League of Nations was kind of a disappointment right from the beginning. Uh, 1919, uh, China was very unhappy with the League. But in the early 1920s, they started kind of growing to the idea, and a lot of Chinese were supporting it. So we had really nice, so we went from bad to good. By the time we get into the late 1920s, we get a lot more critique of the League of Nations. So we have a look at these. Just a couple examples from the articles at the time. The first one, 600,000 francs, just too expensive. Second one, taxation without representation. The League of Nations was really expensive, and basically everybody, well not everybody, a lot of intellectuals in China just felt that this was supporting white imperialism. So, the third criticism. Because the League exists, the power's invasion of weak and small nations is organized. The Ruo So I mentioned this above um, with, um, in connection to Sun Yat-sen's speech of nationalism. This is 1926, so it's two years after that. Now Sun Yat-sen used the term, but only for a few years before he died. The term had only been coined in 1921. It was actually Chen Du Xiao. Um, so you might know Chen Du Xiao was the, um, uh, one of the founders of the Communist Party in 1921. So he published an artic this article in Xin Qingnian, the famous Xin Qingnian, in 1921, just as he's founding the Communist Party and becoming its first leader. And he defined the idea of Ruo Xiao Minzu in relation to the common uh, slogan or the common idiom, ruo ruo qiang shi, the strong eat the weak. But the weak and the strong, according to Chen Du Xiao, are nations here. So we have the imperialist powers versus the oppressed or colonized nations. Not just colonized nations, it's the idea of the, the ruo xiao min su was was much broader than that. So it's a slightly different dichotomy of understanding the world. And of course, the League of Nations is basically representing the imperialist powers. No surprise there. Throughout the 1920s, this becomes uh, an interesting keyword in Chinese writing. Surprisingly, lots in literature. You can go through um, the Shanghai Library catalog in the 1920s and see collections of short fiction that use this word in the title. Short fiction from Irish authors, Jewish, New Zealand, Korean, and Taiwanese writers. So intellectuals across the spectrum uh, were, were supportive of the idea of China leading the Ruo Xiao, based upon Sun Yat-sen's words. And there were many different ways about how they dis came to, 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 to decide that China should be the leader. Um, one interesting one is, is by Wang Jingwei, um, who at the time was, was believed to be the next big leader of, of China, right? And he said, there's no way you can call China small. It's weak, but it's really big. So he said, the reason China should be the leader is because China is the ruo da minzu. It's the weak and big nation. So... Similar arguments by many different intellectuals use facts of China's size, population, culture, and history to explain and justify the need for Chinese leadership of the Ruo Xiao. And this was always connected to Sun Yat-sen's ideas on nationalism. So this is interesting. This is from um, uh, a, 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 an important journal in 1930, Xin Yaxia, an official journal of the Kuomintang. So, uh, official of the, the, the Republic of China. I think it's quite absurd. Firstly, only the Chinese nation has a population large enough to fight against the white race. Might be true that one. Secondly, the Chinese nation has a completely superior national character in terms of its national moral structure, national ideology, and national ability. Thirdly, under the leadership of the three principles of the people, 
the Chinese nation will never succumb to writing the coattails of imperialism and use force to persecute other nations. So again, the importance of benevolence. So Asianism is, is, um, is still a, a, a benevolent concept um, and always connected to the idea of the nation. Now, quotes such as this, or this kind of writing, was mo were mostly in intended for a domestic audience. So we have to keep that in mind. They weren't trying to promote this idea outside of China. The idea or discussions of China as world leader were intended to build nationalism and cement the position of the Kuomintang, because only the Kuomintang could actually lead China in this position of leadership. This is particularly true for the journal New Asia, which I think I have a, is there a New Asia slide. New Asia was, was if, you, if you looked at the opening pages for the editor-in-chief, the editor-in-chief was Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, you, you'd think he was busy running the country, but no. And um, the first few articles were always written by really important people in the Kuomintang. So if you know people like Hu Hanmin or Dai Ji Tao would write the opening articles. So these were like the intellectual elite of the period, the intellectual party elite. So it was quite an influential journal. And like many unofficial publications in the 1920s, New Asia promoted China as a leader of Asia. Territory and geography were also central themes in this, in this journal. So we have the first kind of generation of uh, anthropologists, ethnographers, really, really coming to the fore in the late 1920s and early 1930s, writing about the frontiers of China. You kind of get an idea from this map. They were writing about the, what we now call the ethnic minorities on the frontiers. They were also writing about those just outside of China. And there were interesting arguments, discussions, but sometimes really arguments, um, going from one edition to the next, about this idea of the Han Chinese as the leaders of a multicultural China. And of course, then we have China as the leader of multicultural Asia. But what really captured my attention in terms of the idea of leadership was the connection between the concept of Asianism and advocacy for a new kind of international organization which was called the International of Nations. So in 1925, just before, or 1925, just after Sun Yat-sen's death, Dai Ji Tao, who's kind of like his main key intellectual figure, his secretary at times, Dai Ji Tao began promoting this idea of something called the International of Nations. And he explained the need for the international, saying that, you know, the world is going towards these international organizations, the League of Nations, and the, um, the Third International. But so both of those are actually white imperialist organizations. He actually never called the Third International imperialist until 1927, um, because the Kuomintang separates with the Communist Party in 1927, right? So 1927 is a key, key time for that, those small changes. But race was a really important factor to all of these writers, and the idea of working with the League of Nations and the Third International was very problematic. So, oops. Oh yeah. Okay. Sorry. This slide got cut in half. Um, So this is kind of at the time when we switch from the Communist Party and the Kuomintang working together to their split in 1927. 1926, before the split, the Second National Congress of the Kuomintang, um, this is actually when Mao Zedong gave a famous talk on the peasantry. It was actually at a KMT 
Congress. Members from both of the party voiced their support for the idea of the international and leading the Ruoxiao nations. Scholarships were prepared for Ruoxiao nations and delegates from various countries were invited to this Congress. Most of them from Southeast Asia. Once we pass 1927 and we get into the 1930s, it seems much more likely, much more unlikely, that anybody really thought this international had any chance. But the rhetoric becomes even stronger. So in the 1930s, you can really feel that it becomes a kind of propaganda piece to be used against the authority of both the League of Nations and the Third International. The Kuomintang were really trying hard to say, we're not, con we're not controlled by uh, foreign powers. The, the, the Communist Party is, because they're under the Third International, but, but somehow we're not. It wasn't a, an argument that was easy for them to make at the time. Aha. So uh, this is from the one full-length book about the International of Nations. Um, it's not dated. I read it in the, the, the Shanghai Library. I'm quite sure it's from 1930 or 1931 by the content. And Dujo, the, um, the writer, says, the fundamental program of the operation is none other than political and economic alliance, as the League of Nations is actually a political alliance to unite white imperialism against Ruoxiao nations, the Third International is a political alliance of red imperialism. Now, a lot of intellectuals really caught up onto this idea of white imperialism versus red imperialism at this time. And this continues from the late 1920s right into the 1940s. Disappears in 1945, not surprisingly. Um, okay. But despite lots of writing on this International of Nations, and including a full length book, it was never really clear what it was. They never really clarified it. It wasn't, I don't believe it was, anybody ever believed it was going to happen. It was more of an assertion of moral superiority, right? So at this time, the 1920s, 1930s, um, they used the idea in connection with the three principles of the people to say that uh, the International of Nations is the Asian or sometimes the international extension of the three principles. It's kind of interesting because during the war, um, the Japanese also said that the great Asianism was an extension of the three principles. And Japan's really important here. So similar rhetoric starting to come out of Japan at this point. So Japan is also, um, Japan had always been writing about Asianism but the, the, the national government had always been opposed to the ideas of Asianism until we get um, re actually really into the war. But by this point, you're getting a lot of writings about something called a, um, a Monroe Doctrine for East Asia. If, I don't know if, you know if you've heard of the Monroe Doctrine. It was an American thing. The Americans said the Monroe Doctrine, they, they created the Monroe Declaration, which said America is the America of the Americans. A really clunky title. Um, but the idea is no other foreign power should invade. And if a foreign power does, we should all fight back together. And so the Japanese started saying Asia is the Asia of the Asians. Um, so an exact copy of the American ideas. They even called it the Asian Monroe Doctrine. So the KMT were pushed into a corner here because they really needed to differentiate their idea of a united Asia from Japanese versions. And they basically fail at doing this. Uh, the Japanese visions become more and more popular. Not popular, more and more uh, common. Uh, they're reprinted in Chinese newspapers regularly. Now, 
Li Dajiao, if he had still been around at this point, he might have said, his arguments about Asianism always said there should be no leader. We cannot have leadership. As soon as you have leadership, you have hegemony. But uh, late writers in the 1920s and 1930s did not see it that way. And most of them saw China as leading Asia through this. Okay. So this becomes weaker and weaker. And then 1937, Japan, of course, invades all of China. All of these journals that I was looking at stop in 1937. No surprise. I mean, they physically had to stop, but even if they didn't, they didn't want to keep promoting these, these ideas of propaganda. After 1937, a couple of years later, the building up the collaborationist governments in Nanjing and uh, Beijing. Shanghai as well had one. They all used um, these very same concepts that we saw in the 1920s and 1930s as propaganda to justify working with the Japanese and the Japanese rule during the war. So 1937's total end point um, and totally changes everything for the idea of Asians. Well, it doesn't totally change it because it keeps going. So, in conclusion, of uh, looking at the lasting influence of ideas of Asianism. So we can't argue that the 1920s and 30s discussions of China <laughs> and leading the Ruoxiao nations assisted in establishing China's relative position and international uh, role for some intellectuals. And this might even influence post-war thought in terms of the Bandung Conference, uh, where people uh, gather together to consider possibilities of Asian alliance, issues of ideas of Afro-Asianism, working with Africa, and ideas of the third world, which Mao Zedong was promoting especially. So, and of course it's China as leader of the third world. Now real connections can also be argued to exist between these ideas of Asianism in the 20s and 30s and the Japanese concepts of the greater East Asian new order and the co-prosperity sphere. These were concepts that were central to Japan's war effort. And perhaps the propaganda from the 1920s and 1930s lengthened the war and gave a lot of support to Japan because of this. Both Japan and the collaborationist governments regularly cited Sun Yat-sen's great Asianism and nationalism, just as Chinese intellectuals had cited these throughout the 1920s and 1930s. So I spent a lot of time reading uh, propaganda from the 1940s, wartime propaganda published in Nanjing and Beijing and elsewhere. And um, it's really interesting because it's identical to the text that you get in the 1920s and 1930s. But there's one fundamental difference that um, uh, a, a lot of these writers in the, in, during the wartime just ignored. And that was the issue of Japanese leadership. So, uh, of course, during the war, they were much more willing to accept the idea of Japanese leadership. Now, I'm going to end with a kind of Asianist perspective on, um, on the war. Um, I'm going to look at one introduce you to one of the leaders of the uh, collaborationist movement and the Wang Jingwei government, Li Shengwu. Do we have him there? There we go. He was the last foreign minister. He wasn't a foreign minister for very long. I think he became foreign minister in 1945. But he was a close associate of Wang Jingwei and uh, the pro-Japanese government throughout the war. So... As Japan's defeated, the concept of Asianism was defeated, right? It became taboo and disappeared from Chinese writing. So from this perspective, the demise of Asianism wasn't really related to anything to do with the concept, but it was, to, it was related to the victory of the Allied forces and the Chinese governments that they supported. So Li Shengwu's regrets on the period really show the tragedy of Chinese politics at the time. In hindsight, it is clear that Wang Jingwei and I made a grave mistake by choosing Japanese patronage. But if Wang and I were traitors because we collaborated with a foreign power, 
So were Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong. The difference was that their patrons won in World War II and our patron lost. You see, victory and defeat in the Chinese political arena were determined by international events. We, the politicians in China, could not control our own destiny. So the power has inevitably carved China into two countries, both competing for power and legitimacy. The Soviet Union and America extended their influence over Chinese propaganda. And Asianism, a concept that was in direct conflict with both of these two world powers, no longer had any place in the Chinese vocabulary, maybe until the 21st century. From the perspective of the Asianists, red imperialism and white imperialism had won the war over China. Korea and Taiwan no longer were struggling between the Asian empires of China and Japan. They were forced to turn to the newer empires of the United States and the Soviet Union, and Asia slipped into the Cold War. And that's it. Sorry for going over time. With me. Thank you so much. That was terrific, and I'm sure... I'm not the only one who wants to rush to your book to see how this all fills out and uh, you know becomes complexified and the pre-story and the post-story and everything. So, thanks so much. Fascinating.